introduction. So Malini, how does it feel this morning? Are you feeling fresh and I know you had a long journey here. I do. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I always feel when you're in a room full of women, the energy is always amazing and everyone's smiling and I see your friends and fans are here <laughs> sending you so much love and I really love that about women. So why don't you guys give yourselves a round of applause for being so amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so I slept lots. I was very jet lagged and I went to sleep at 10 p.m., which never happens. I woke up at six like, wow, this is amazing. I'm glad you got good sleep. And definitely, I do feel blessed to have all my friends here. It just makes every moment very special. And this is, in fact, a very wow moment for us to have you here with us. And you're looking ravishing. I want to know, Malini, that you're a small town girl. Like, we all are here from Aurangabad and married here, born, bought up here, a lot of us. And you're coming from Allahabad. How does a girl from a small town like ours make it to Tinseltown? So I guess it's kind of a crazy journey. I was born in Allahabad and I know that uh, everyone knows Amitabh Bachchan was too, so that's sort of my claim to fame. Uh, my dad was in the Indian Foreign Service, so as soon as like, I was born, six months later we moved. And the reason why I have a funny accent is we moved every three years. So I lived in Somalia, Lebanon, Greece, Germany, Bulgaria, and Ivory Coast. Everywhere we lived three or four years. So I was really grateful and lucky to have had that exposure and experience all my life. And then when he retired, I came back to um, India. I lived in Delhi for six years. And my first job was a backup dancer for Sukhbir. So that song, Ho Ho Ho, is like in my brain, ingrained for life now. And then I joined MTV India as a digital um, creator. And then I joined radio as a, in sort of a presenter. I had a radio show for like 10 years called Horn OK Please. I used to write a gossip column in the midday called Malini's Mumbai. Then I joined Channel V as their digital content head. And along the way, I started the blog. Now, the reason why I tell you all these different things is because I really feel like I live the Bombay dream. You know, people always say you have to have a lot of money, you have to have a lot of connections, you have to make compromises. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, I'm living proof that you don't have to do any of those things. If you genuinely really feel that something is meant to be for you, and I'm sure all women believe this, you believe in the power of the universe, the power and the laws of attraction. And the more and more I see that is that what you put out there comes back to you. And if you really believe, that something is going to happen for you. It doesn't matter how small or big a town you're from. It does come true. There's one amazing concept, a Japanese concept called Ikigai that I came across. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a beautiful concept. When people try to figure out what it is they should be doing in life, what is my purpose, what is my passion, just try to answer these four questions, okay? First, what do I love to do? Second, what am I good at doing? Third, what can I get paid to do? And four, what does the world need? Now, if you make a list of these things, and you'll find at the center of that your ikigai, your passion. And in this day and age, as women, we're very lucky that you can make anything your career, literally. And so as long as you are able to check all those four boxes, you will feel that satisfaction. And the universe will conspire to make it happen for you. And it did conspire to make it happen for you. And I would have loved your childhood bouncing around the world. I only bounced between Aurangabad. Delhi and Bombay, that's all the luxury I got. <laughs> it's still a good trajectory, I like these cities. <laughs> so you have more than 50 lakh followers over various social media platforms and you're the reason for disrupting popular mo you know, business models that existed then like Starbucks, uh, Stardust and Filmfare and so many more. What uh, did you know that these brands didn't and why couldn't they adopt to these new trends? So honestly, when I started out writing my blog, there was no concept of blogging, right? It wasn't a career. It wasn't something that happened. I really was doing it for fun. And the more that I think about it, I didn't really start out trying to be a blogger or get X amount of followers. And I think that really is kind of the secret to the success that I got was the fact that I wasn't really trying to pursue this as a career. And whenever I look at, you know, large magazines or newspapers, I don't really like to make that comparison because they have a place in everyone's hearts. I still love picking up a magazine and reading a Stardust or a Cine Blitz. I really like the feel and the glossy, you know, of, you know, the Vogue and the L. I think there's a place for everyone in it. And I think that slowly people are adapting to social media. But more and more, I'm starting to realize, and, and you know, it might sound kind of controversial to say, that it really doesn't matter anymore how many followers you have. And I struggle with this because whenever people introduce me and they talk about it, they're like X amount of followers, and it doesn't matter. 
It really doesn't matter. I think more and more what matters is what is the connection and what is the experience you're having even with the five people that might be following you. And I don't know if you know this, I, I run something called Malini's Girl Tribe. Oh, we just hit 30,000 members today, so we're super excited. And the reason why I love it, thank you, is because much more than the 4 lakh or 40 million, this 30,000, this number means so much more to me because there are real women connecting on a real scale. And on social media, you know what happens is you go online thinking, now I can connect with 7 billion people. I'm going to have so many great interactions. And then you go online and nobody replies to you. Nobody follows you. And you feel even lonelier than when you went on. And what happens is a lot of celebrities will post something and they'll get tons of likes, they'll get tons of comments, but when a regular person posts something, you know, and then you make yourself feel like I'm just a regular person, you don't get a response. And what I love about the Girl Tribe or communities like yours, wow, is that you are actually seeing each other. You are responding to each other. You're being somebody's witness, which is actually what matters the most. So from now on, I, I, I don't really want people to think about me as with X amount of followers. I think all of us should think about ourselves as someone who has had some kind of positive impact on somebody else. And that's really fantastic to know because I think being women, we go through that pressure of keeping up with social media, getting that perfect selfie out. And I did see your uh, TEDx talk on uh, you know, how to use social media and we never got educated on it and how the pressure actually builds on art. And it did make me feel good about my 200 followers. So I said, I'm making an impact for myself. <laughs> So uh, tell me, Malini, like, uh, what is the difference between a good blogger and a famous popular blogger like you and an influencer? And was it always your intent to be an influencer? So the thing is, there was no concept of influencer when I started, right? People just knew me as a blogger, or they knew me as a radio jockey, or they knew me as a VJ. There's always this different terminology. And influencer marketing just came up as this new term, and now everybody wants to be an influencer. It's the most popular career of choice. And unfortunately, it's got a little bit of a tarnished image, because people think, okay, influencers just want to get paid a lot of money to sell you products. And unfortunately, that can be true to some degree. But think about any career that became popular. So when I'm 42, when I was in my teens, being a VJ was the coolest job. Right, So everybody wanted to be a VJ, but then people also had negative things to say about that. Yeah. Um, so I think the difference really is not so much about being an influencer or a blogger, it's what kind of influence are you. I saw this amazing Instagram video, I can't take credit because it's not mine, but I love sharing it. It says, you know, this concept of influencer, you have to st step back and think as an influencer, what kind of influence am I being? If I'm just standing in front of fancy cars or showing people this amazing life I'm living, am I making them feel bad about themselves? And he had a great analogy. He said, maybe influencer is not always a great thing because when you're under the influence, you're not well, you're drunk, and you might, have, you might be drunk driving and hurt someone. So the rule you should apply to be an influencer is, do people leave my feed happier or sadder than when they came? And if they're leaving happier, then that's good influence. Otherwise, you're not really contributing. So you're not really being an influencer. Wow, it's a really different perspective. Uh, you already shared with us that uh, you just started blogging and you didn't have an intent to really make it in like a brand or build it like a business. But when, you, when it caught on and you realized that this is really picking up and it has a business model as well, so what vision did you create for it? So when I started, it was predominantly about entertainment, right? So we covered Bollywood news and entertainment news, and everyone always asked me, do you get paid to write about Bollywood? I'm like, no, because that would be really wrong <laughs> to get people to pay me for those things. But over time, just like a magazine, you have commercials, and they'll have an ad for a makeup brand or a perfume. So people started buying uh, promotional time for something called advertorial. So they would say, okay, we want people to buy more Levi's jeans. Why don't you do a feature on the kinds of body types that fit certain types of jeans? So it's more of editorial content created for that. So slowly that started becoming a business model because people were taking their marketing spend, their budget that they would put in outdoor or on print or television and taking it digital because that's where people were living. You know, you have to go to where the party is if people are on Facebook constantly. You know, we check our phones 80 times a day. It's pretty crazy. And you keep coming across ads, whether it's on Instagram or Twitter or wherever you are. So that's kind of what the business model started out to be. When I started to really think of it as a business, 
I decided that I wanted to be a business with integrity, so we were very careful that we wouldn't do anything with brands I don't agree with. Like, we won't do anything with fairness creams, even though it's such a large industry, because I feel it makes people feel really bad about themselves. I've grown up with acne. I'm 42. I still break out, and, and I really don't like the idea of telling people they have to have this perfect, fair skin. So it turned into a business model over time, and now there are many pieces to it. So there's the blog, but we do, uh, we have our own ad agency called uh, Agent M Creative. So we do full-fledged ads. I don't know if you've seen the Pepper Fry ads that look like a boomerang on TV. Those, we made those. Um, we do TV shows, so we've done five seasons of television, as you know, uh, you mentioned earlier. And we do a lot of um, now podcasting, a lot of video content. So the good thing is in multimedia, you have so many different forms of content that you can create. And everybody wants to be part of that message. Everybody wants to get involved in that. So that's kind of the business model. For me, over time, I've had kind of a, I guess, a good existential crisis where I was like, okay, I've been doing entertainment for 10 years. What does it really mean? What is my, what's my legacy? And some of my role models are people like Oprah Winfrey or Ariana Huffington, and I really love what they've done. And even Ariana had the Huffington Post, but then she went on to do something called Thrive, which really helps people live better lives. She wrote this amazing book uh, about the sleep revolution, and I don't know if you know this, the reason she wrote that book is that she's a workaholic. And one day she was in her office and she just passed out. She hit her head on the table and had a huge cut. And she went to the doctor and they told her she's just not getting enough sleep. And she could have really badly hurt herself, you know, almost died. So she's like, okay, I need to step back and think about what the purpose of my life is. So that's where Enter Girl Tribe and this community where I feel that what happens is a lot of people need empowerment. But empowerment has become kind of a boring, angry girls club when people look at it, they're like, okay, here they go again. But I think you can make it fun, you can make it sexy, you can make it young and interesting, and you don't need to put it in a box that it's only for women. I don't think empowerment for women works unless men join the conversation. They're the biggest role models for the men. So when we did um, our Women's Day video, I said, I only want men in it. And we did a video where they had to read the creepy messages we get on Facebook. And I asked guys, do you ever get weird messages on Facebook? And they don't, and all of us do. We all have, hi, dear, hello, be my friend, sister. Everyone has got those messages. <laughs> And they read them and they were so shocked to see that this is what happens. And I think this is the process of education, that you have to let people into that world without being mad at them, without being angry. Uh, and I think that entertainment can be so empowering, right? Whether it's like, for instance, Ananya Birla, who you know, is a singer but also an entrepreneur and is you know, making her own way in the world. Or you have people like Aduna Akhtar who has her own chain of salons and is an independent woman and it's not just about, oh, Farhan and her are divorced, she has her own identity. That's empowerment too, you know, talking about people who run their own course. So that's kind of my purpose now. It's a very long answer to your very simple question, but I hope it made sense. No, definitely. I'm going to connect one of my later questions actually to it. So what is your mission with Girl Tribe? Like you said, it's empowerment, but how does Girl Tribe work? And how has it you know, already impacted lives? Has it changed anything yet? So the way it works is right now it's a community on Facebook. It's called Malini's Girl Tribe. And what I love is that people can talk about anything. Because I really don't like this word women's issues. Because women's issues is just rape and menstruation for most people. But everything is a woman's issue. Travel, food, mental health, work, relationships literally everything. So it's a community where people can come talk about anything, ask anything, share anything. And what I love is that people are feeling open enough to talk about everything from their mental health issues to their relationship issues to finding work to where can I travel? Hey, I'm going to Europe. Does anybody want to come with me? And I have seen some incredible impact. I, and especially when it comes to people sharing things that they're dealing with. So like a girl recently posted about how she feels like her cousin is probably overstepping and they were playmates for a long time, but now she feels that maybe he's on borderline abusing her, and she got a lot of advice and help, and she's been able to report it. Um, there's been, you know, I met a girl, I was out for dr dinner, and she came up to me, and she was like, I just want to say thank you for the girl tribe, because I was really depressed, and these uh, girls really helped pull me out of it, and I'm out today. Some of the best stories are this girl put up a post saying, I'm going to be traveling to London for two weeks, and my parents are alone, and they're old. Can somebody check on them? And she put 
her father's phone number. And so many people called and checked. And where else on social media will you see things like that happening? And what we try to do is now we do physical events. We do meetups. So we did something called a Brave, which is a breakfast rave. It's a 7 a.m. Bollywood dance party. So it starts with yoga and dance meditation. And then we all hang out. And it was just such great energy, you know? You don't need to drink a lot of alcohol in the morning. You could just go dance, have fun, and just let loose. Um, and then we did a really fun one for Mother's Day where girls from the tribe brought their mothers along. And you know, I think all of us know this. Our moms don't want much. They just want to spend time with us and to know what we're up to. And I don't think we spend enough time doing that. And one of the things I feel strongest about is that the world kind of makes women irrelevant after they cross 40. You start on this downward spiral where people start ignoring you, brands aren't talking to you anymore. And I'm like, it shouldn't be that way because as proven by everyone who is the room, women after their 40s are the most independent, have the most financial stability, are the most comfortable in their own bodies, and have the decision-making power for where the family goes to eat, where they shop, what they wear, where they travel. So it's a big mistake for people to write us off, you know? So what I love about this community is that the age group is 16 to 80. My mom is 80 and she's the biggest attender of Friday Club events, I'm oh, sorry, Girl Tribe events and messages and, and part of the community. So the thing that I feel is most important that there's a lot of different women's groups that do different things and I really want to bring them all together as one tribe because the fallacy has been that people think that women have to be in competition with each other. I just put up something on Instagram that I love that says, I don't need to unscrew any other girl's light bulb to shine myself. And it's so true. And I think people are starting to realize that, oh no, women are now realizing they can come together and work together. And now everybody else should be a little bit afraid. And I like that men are a little bit afraid now, which is probably a healthy thing for them. Um, and I feel that the big thing that's missing online especially is empathy and kindness. Because online, everyone is so quick to be defensive or angry and attack each other because a lot of things are lost in text translation. You read something very differently sometimes than it was meant. And I want the internet to become a safer, more wholesome place for women that they can actually connect and, and find that emotional satisfaction. Because the one thing people don't address is my emotional happiness. You can get a lot of advice on where to get a job, where to shop, you know, all of those things, but how do I deal with my anxiety and the things that I worry about without getting pegged into a you need mental health help? Sometimes it's not to that extreme. Sometimes it's just a daily conversation with people. That's so true. Actually, sisterhood is the most empowering, and you learn this after you leave your mom's home. Until then, boyfriends are everything. <laughs> So yeah, definitely, I think I count on that as well now. You know, you need anything, your sisters are with you. And this is really wonderful to know how Girl Tribe is developing and helping so many other women. Uh, what is the brand vision ahead? Like, is there something more coming? Are you going to reinvent? Yeah, so I mean, the brand vision is that, you know, the next 500 million people that are coming online are going to be doing some from different parts of India, a lot of them in vernacular languages. So we plan to expand out and grow our languages, do various uh, things in smaller cities as well. We're also going to la launch South Indian cinema uh, on the blog because I feel that there's such great content and so many amazing superstars, but they don't get featured as much. And I think that's a big mistake because some of the South Indian stars have bigger fan followings than, in fact, Bollywood does. Um, I also feel that your social media stars and influencers that are good influencers need to be given more airtime and talked about because a lot of them, if you notice, come out and talk about their issues. You know, like Lily Singh is actually here tomorrow, so we're doing, you know, an uh, interview with her, but we're able to have her talk about her insecurities and her fears. So we definitely want to expand out. So little things, what we're trying to do is create content and entertainment that also opens your eyes about things. So for instance, Kalki's pregnant and she wanted to announce that, but she didn't want to go to the usual press who the first thing they'll say is, oh, but she's not married. But that's not what she wanted to focus on. She's very happy that she's having a child with someone that she loves. And so I wanted to be able to have that conversation. Samira Reddy wanted to talk about breastfeeding and how, why do, you know, as soon as you say the word breast out loud, like all the guys sort of start to, to squeamish, even some women start to feel uncomfortable and it shouldn't be that way so I want to be able to have these conversations where we try to understand where this comes from and so the plan is to use our entertainment relationships in a good way and build content that 
empowers and entertains you at the same time. We're doing a lot of, uh, we're now going to be launching some shows on Amazon and Netflix soon, which are going to be fun, entertaining shows. I'm hoping to one day do my Oprah type talk show, then I can be like, you get a car, you get a car. One of those things. Um, and, you know, so, and then do a lot more podcasts, which are, you know, about topics like self, self care and well being. So it's a, a show called Exhale, which is really, so I find it very difficult to find time to work on myself. You know, everyone says, just work out for 10 minutes. I somehow cannot even find 10 minutes. They do self-care face routine half an hour. I'm like, I just barely wash my face twice a day. You know, like I don't find the time for that. So I wanted this show to be something that makes it really simple to follow. And I wanted to answer questions that people really have. So what is your specific concern about something, you know? Like even simple things where you know that there's certain things that you can do, because I have really bad period cramps, so what are the little quick fixes I can apply, like a hot water bottle or things like that, without it becoming this overwhelming, must go to the doctor, is something wrong with you, you know, sort of take on things. So I just want to simplify things and approach it the way that it would probably appeal to me. And I'm writing another book, by the way, which I, I really have to finish by December, so I really start writing. I must share that I am an Oprah, like I, I bred Oprah, like I didn't read Oprah, but uh, I grew up admiring yeah, of Oprah course. as amazing. well. And of course she was my idol as well. And you don't look a day over 30, so you don't need any more face care. <laughs> I'm 42 and I'm proud of it. I'm so happy that I finally... I finally know who I am, you know, I don't feel uncomfortable with my body, I don't feel so insecure, I don't feel so shy, I feel better than I've ever felt in my 20s, to be honest, so now when anyone says, oh, you don't look that age, I'm like, no, I do, I'm so happy that this is what 42 looks like to me, you know. It's beautiful. So this content that you're developing, it's more for Instagram and Facebook, or it's going to go on to like Netflix and Amazon? Everywhere. So I feel that now you have to create content that goes across platforms because you have to go to where people are consuming it. So we're going to customize the content for that platform. Like, you know, Instagram is a very visual medium and you know, Twitter is more conversational. So you adapt the content that fits best on that platform. Uh, some new platforms that are really rising are things like TikTok, which I'm sure you've heard of. And I know TikTok has a bad rep for some of the content that it has, but I think that there is an opportunity to use TikTok to do good content as well. Any platform can be used for, for good content, right? It's up to the creators, really. So it's going to be across platforms. And one thing we've always tried to do is adopt whatever new technology and platforms come about, because otherwise you'll lose the next generation. If they're using Snapchat and you're just doing stuff on Facebook. A lot of people don't even use Facebook that much anymore. It's more just like, okay, I know where I can reach my friends and family if I need to. But I think everyone's trying to evolve, even with Facebook. The reason they've created groups is because people are actually coming back online to use Facebook groups. And that's one of the reasons we've created a group there. Um, online content faces a lot of credibility issues. Uh, what's your take on that? I get it, you know, I think in media especially, it's, it's a lot about it's gossip, right? Every time I go anywhere, even friends and family be like, tell me some gossip. And I want to tell them I don't really know anything for sure. I've heard the same gossip you've heard. And I don't want to confer or deny anything that I don't know for sure. And we took a, a call really early on that we're not going to do negative gossip and we're not going to write about who's doing drugs or who's sleeping with who because there's enough people who do that and more power to them. People want to consume that, go for it. But I realized this early on and, and there was two things that happened. One, when I first started the blog, we used to do some gossip, and I remember we had written something about some actress, and then I was going to some party, and I knew she was going to be there, and I was so worried about running into her that she would be mad at me. And I realized, like, that's strange, right? That I think of myself as a good person, but somehow the internet had given me this free pass to behave in a way that I would never do in real life. So I set myself a rule, which was I'm never going to... Thank you. It was a hard lesson, but it was a good one. I set myself a rule that I'll never write anything I can't say to somebody's face. And if you apply that to your own social media, you'll realize what a difference it'll make in how you behave. Whether you comment a certain way or whether you respond a certain way, you would do it very differently. For example, we, we've stopped looking at social media as an alternate reality, which is what it is, right? It was meant to be a way to extend your ability to connect on a scale that you can't in real life. I can have 5,000 friends on Facebook and meet them at different times or WhatsApp groups, but I can't do that in real life. But somehow we steered off that and we started doing things online that would not um, ever fly in the real world. So for example, the kind of things people say online or on Instagram or on blogs, imagine if that was 
um, the same thing in the real world. Would you go to somebody's house uninvited and loudly say in front of all their friends to them, you look ugly, fat, or stupid? Would you walk around just taking pictures of yourself and leaving without talking to anyone else? For guys, would you drop your pants to say hello? You would never do any of these things, right? But somehow on social media, we behave in a way that we just don't in real life. We use it as a dumping ground for all our negative emo emotions. And that's kind of what I said in my TEDx was that if you were to just revisit, even on a small scale for yourself, the next time you post something, let that be your filter. Would I say this out loud to someone? Would I say the same thing if I was talking to someone? If not, then maybe I shouldn't write it just because black mirror technology is giving me that free pass. What am I posting? Is it sparking joy? Have you seen the show Tidying Up, Mary Kondo? She teaches me how to fold everything really yeah. amazingly. I love that show. I've yeah. now learned how to fold everything beautifully. But she talks about only holding on to the things that spark joy, that have a good memory. What if you, whenever you post something, you spark joy with what you post? And the third most important rule on social media is remember that followers are people too. All of us in this room are followers of someone or something, and we have been turned into a number count, and we're all guilty of doing it, which is why when I say people look at how many followers, how many numbers, you're counting all those people as one number, and just because they weren't 50,000, the 400 are not good enough. What about those people? Even the 10 that decided to like or see you or comment, those people matter too, and I think I encourage you to sometimes just go through your feed, the people that follow you or the people that have liked the post and look at their picture. Because then you will start seeing them as human beings. You'll start remembering that these are people as well. And that's what we want everyone else to do with us too, right? So I think that's kind of the change, the difference between um, the fake news and the real news is you, you choose your adventure, right? You can choose to consume as much gossip and fake news as you want, but apply a filter to it, you know? Um, and what I've started to do is because people always ask me, how do you detox, digital detox? I can't do it. I can't go off my phone, I'll be honest, because it's not so much taking the break, it's when I come back, I'll have so much email, so many messages, I won't be able to cope. So my digital detox is kind of unorthodox. I spend a couple of hours every day reading positive quotes or going and following Instagram accounts about the universe or 1111 or make a wish or happy things. And that's kind of my detox from any negativity. And if you don't have time to do a digital detox, I encourage you to do that. That's a great idea. But what you said is so true because there's so much pressure. Now, when you get ready for an event, you want to take that perfect picture. And I think my husband's just irritated. Like, you, there'll ne be never, nothing that satisfies you enough. So just let it be. And you feel disappointed, actually, that, you know, my Insta picture is not as good. And Deepika looks so beautiful in every picture that she takes. And yeah, it, it adds a lot of pressure. It has a lot of pressure. And in fact, we're going to do, we do a lot of Girl Tribe Lives in the group and I encourage you to watch. So Krisha Bajaj, I don't know if you know her. She's a designer, lovely girl. Her Instagram feed is beautiful. So she'll be like in, you know, Greece and the sky will match her dress. And the point is, she even talks about the fact that this does not hope happen overnight. It's a lot of work, just like anything else. So don't feel disappointed about your Instagram feed because somebody else is choosing to wake up at 6 in the morning, plan their wardrobe to match the sky, planning you know, how they're packing to make that something they want to do, which is great, but they've spent that much time and energy on it. So don't try to get that quick fix in comparison. And now more and more people are liking the real part of your feed. And you don't need to always put everything up on your Instagram feed, right? That's the great thing about Instagram stories. You don't have to worry about the lighting and the quality. You can just be yourself. But I, again, at the end of the day, think about if something is giving you so much stress that my picture is not looking good and I'm comparing. Stop yourself, and I struggle with this too, but stop yourself and say, why is this bothering me? Is this bothering me for me? Is this bothering me because I think other people are going to judge me? Is this bothering me because this picture is not going to get that many likes? The truth of the matter is the pictures that will get the most likes will probably be some hot girl in a bikini. And it's just the sad state of affairs that there's a lot of, you know, slightly creepy guys out there who spend all day doing that but are not really interacting with the girl. That doesn't mean you need to do that. That doesn't mean she shouldn't do that. That's her journey too. But I think trying to compare your Instagram feed to a celebrity who probably has two makeup artists, three stylists, 10 people taking pictures, two light guys, is never gonna be the same, you know? So if anything, you should compare the quality of 
how people think of you. Like you should be really excited that some people are here supporting and smiling at you for who you are, much more than how many people like your picture on Instagram. For sure, yeah. <laughs> So paparazzi in India has now become as intrusive. You, know, you see like baby pictures of stars being like floated all over social media, newspapers, everything. Um, and they're as intrusive as anywhere in the world now. So what is your view on that? And how, how do you think this will ever like change? So it depends on what you consider intrusive, right? I think in the case of Taimur, who's a star on his own, the parents don't seem to mind his pictures being posted. They post a lot themselves. So I think it becomes intrusive at a point where if someone says, please stop, and you don't stop. Otherwise, in a lot of celebrity culture, they actually like to be photographed. They like to be featured. I think it is tough for the kids because they're going to grow up in this environment. Um, but to be honest, in the Indian Bollywood environment, they're probably going to grow up and become film stars. So this is just preparation, in a sense. Um, but I think that you have to know where to draw the line. I think. Unfortunately, it's a vicious circle because the press is intrusive and tries to get gossip because there are enough people who want to see it and read it and consume it. If we didn't consume it, they wouldn't make it. So before you can judge the press, to be honest, we have to think about how much do I consume of this? Am I as guilty of wanting to see the baby picture or hear the gossip about someone before I judge someone for writing it for me. But I think that's something that's an internal compass that we have to do. I mean, I'll be honest, I like to see a celebrity's cute baby picture. I find it entertaining to hear a little gossip now and again. But once it starts becoming damaging for that individual, that's when you have to be sort of careful. But yeah, a lot of press does go too far. I've heard people ask the craziest things. I was um, backstage at Fashion Week and one journalist asked this model, this actress and said, so when you go down the runway, madam, do you miss your husband? And she was like, for the 17 seconds that it takes me to walk up and down. And if she had said yes, she would not be serious about her career. And if she said no, you know, what would you think? And so I was interviewing the cast of Mission Mangal. And it's, you know, Akshay Kumar and five actresses, Vidya Bal and Sunakshi, so many amazing actresses. And everyone always asks women, how do you manage your work-life balance? So I said, I'm not going to ask them. And I said, Akshay, I'm going to ask you this question. How do you manage your work-life balance? And he said, he said, I don't understand the question. And he was like, what does it mean? And I'm like, exactly, what does it mean? And why do men, or why do people, not just men, why does everyone ask women this question? And then he said, well, I have a rule. I'll wake up at 7 and after 4 p.m. I won't work, which is true. You have to finish all your shoots with him before 4 p.m. Then he goes and spends time with his family. And I was like, women should be allowed to say that too. They shouldn't have to be defensive of themselves and say, oh, I try really hard to juggle and it's hard. And I met this amazing um, woman called Wendy Clark. She's the uh, first female CEO of Omnicore, like the biggest ad uh, advertising conglomerate internationally. And she said, you know, stop worrying about work-life balance. It's not about work-life balance. It's about work-life integration and try to find that because she said the same thing. She said, when I'm at work, I miss my kids. When I'm at home, I feel I'm not being serious about my work. And we all struggle with this constantly. I don't even have kids, but I understand the pressure. So instead of worrying about it that way, think about the fact that when you're at work, you're getting that decompression and mental stimulation that you need to be able to go home and be a better, more fulfilled parent and a better role model for your kids as well. And if you're a homemaker and you're enjoying being with your kids, Feel happy that you're there and enjoying the time with them that you would have missed if you weren't. So celebrate the qualities of that role. I love that my mom was a homemaker for me and she was always around and hung out. Maybe she would have wanted to go out and work, but she should be happy with whatever environment she's created for herself that she's happy with. I'm not a fan of people saying all women must work. You must go and have a job. You shouldn't just be at home because everyone knows being a mom is like a much harder job than like any other career possible. So it's about finding that balance in your mind saying that I'm going to be happy with how I look, what, what I do with my relationships, and I'm also going to be okay with the days that I don't feel okay. That's true. And I think Sundays are the hardest for me because I don't go to work on Sundays. And then I feel like, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it's all about loving what you do and wanting, you know, what you said about the Japanese experience is just that, that once you know that I love this and you can truly enjoy it. That's definitely that. Yeah. 
Um, I wanted to ask you, would you recommend being an influencer to a young aspirant? Because we watch you and, you know, we desire this. And you, a lot of women and I'm sure men who have this aspiration. I mean, I would in the sense that it depends what you want to do, right? A lot of people come and ask me, how do I become a rich and famous blogger? And I tell them, stop. Like, first, <laughs> don't try to become a rich and famous anything. Think about the one thing that you would want to do for the rest of your life, even if nobody paid you to do it. And try to make that your career because we're lucky that we now live in a time where you can try to do that. So for instance, I, I know this girl, uh, Manjari, she lives in Delhi. She's also in Girl Tribe. She's a makeup artist. She's left-handed. She's from Alabad. I feel like we're twins. She was in advertising for many years, but her passion is makeup. So one day she just quit her job and she decided to become a makeup artist. And she struggled and struggled and did it, but she said, I want to do this even if I'm not going to get paid to do it. And now she's very successful doing it. And so if you, so you see what I'm saying? If you start out saying, okay, how can I become rich doing this? You will never enjoy doing it because you're not going to get rich doing it overnight. But if you say, I want to do this because I love doing it, you're going to be so happy that, hey, every day I'm doing something I love, I'm doing something I love, and you will eventually do something that you love, that you're good at, that you can get paid to do, and the world needs, and boom, it's going to be something that's going to be satisfying. For people who want to be influencers, my word of caution is that you are walking into a world of judgment. You are asking people to give you validation, and you're setting yourself up to sometimes not get it. So the emotional impact of that can be quite high. So decide what you want to be an influencer of. There's some that are amazing. I don't know if you follow Bruised Passports. There's a couple that travel around the world. They have an amazing Instagram account. I love how they do it because they just really enjoy traveling together and they've made a career out of it. But if you, as a young influencer, my main concern is for young women who go online and they want to be beauty bloggers or fashion bloggers and put up you know, pictures and be that, but they don't really want to do that, they feel like they have to fit into a box of a fashion or a beauty blogger to make money, then they may not be very happy because the truth is now the industry is very cluttered. When I started out, maybe it was easier because there weren't so many people doing it. So you could just jump in and you would be one of the first. But now there's a lot more competition. So find something that makes you unique. So even if you are a beauty blogger, what makes you unique? Why you instead of somebody else. Why would I watch this one? So like Natasha Patel is my beauty blogger and she's amazing because she's a real girl next door. For two years, she did all her beauty videos with braces. And she was so, and she got a lot of, you know, trolling, but then she was very confident about it. And now on the other side, everyone has told her how they've made, she's made such a difference to them. They felt so much more confident that you don't have to be perfect to put on makeup and make videos. So you have to find that niche and you have to find your tribe. Who are the people that are going to consume your content? And again, don't go after the large number. People in the world are changing. Think about the fact there was a time you would put up all your pictures on Facebook. Now where do you share them? On a family WhatsApp group, right? So the world is changing. You want to have a community that's smaller. You want a fewer number of people to know your personal life and experiences. And that's how people are following influencers as well. Again, don't go by the number of someone got 500,000 likes on their photo. The amount of people that really care about that person are very few. The ones that are going to engage with that content are very few. You know, like everyone's very excited. Jennifer Aniston's online. She broke the internet. That's amazing, but they love her for the character that she played. But if you just go online hoping to have that same number, you're never, no number will ever be enough. You have a million, you'll want two million. You have two million, you want 10 million. It's just, there's no X number. There, the internet doesn't end anywhere. So you're never going to be complete. So it's really important that if you want to start out being an influencer, find a unique voice, the gap that you're filling, do it because you love doing it, and find your micro tribe, even if it starts with 10 people. Fantastic. Um, did you ever deal with the pressure of keeping up with yourself? Did it ever happen to you? Absolutely. I feel it all the time. I was just on this crazy trip. I went to my in-laws in New York and from there I had to fly to Sydney for one day. It took me 25 hours to get there and 20 hours back. Then I came back and then I came here. So I was super jet lagged and I felt like, am I doing too much? Am I pushing myself too much? And so sometimes I need the downtime and sometimes I feel you know, that maybe I just need to take a couple of days and relax. And it's okay to feel that way. And it's only human to feel that way. And I find more and more now when I share it, people are quite empathetic towards it, you know? So I put up a post today saying that I woke up in the middle of the night yesterday, 
like having a dream about having period cramps. I didn't even have my period, but I felt the pain. And I was like, this is so weird. Like, why is this happening? And someone actually gave me a really interesting um, uh, assessment of this dream on Girl Tribe. She's like, maybe you're thinking about having kids and this is sort of a, your fear from it. I thought it was so, it was so interesting. She said it very nicely, but I thought it was such an interesting interpretation. And I was like, hmm, maybe I am. But I think that now more, if, if you feel comfortable, and I really encourage you to, it's not just a plug. I genuinely feel if you want to share something when you're feeling low, do it on Girl Tribe. You'll see such a nice, genuine response. Um, so yeah, I absolutely have my shitty days. Sometimes I don't want to get out of bed. Sometimes I'm really, you know, mean to my husband. I totally relate if he doesn't take 10 pictures in portrait mode. We have a big fight that night. So it's totally fine, you know. I think the most important thing is to stop and assess for yourself, am I having more bad days than good? And what is making me feel that way? Wow. So, um, Malini, there was this movement, uh, the Me Too movement, and I think all of us were part of it because somewhere or the other, every young girl went through this. Did it impact you as a journalist? Because when this hit, every industry kind of withdrew from women. And I know a couple of friends who said, I'm just going to stop employing women. It's just causing too much trouble. So did you face this as a journalist and being in your industry? Absolutely. In fact, we, because we work so closely with Bollywood, we really thought about it and we're like, OK, we might be burning a lot of bridges, but we have to time, it's time to take a stand. So we were the first few people to write about Vikas Bell, to report any of the stories that came in. And a lot of people wrote to us saying, please take it down. They wanted us to do interviews with everyone from Nana Pataker to, um, I forget the guy who's absolutely horrendous. Also him, <laughs> the other one who plays the father in Mene Pyar Kya. Alok Nath, who then wanted to promote a movie that he's doing with Ajay Devgan, where he plays a judge in a Me Too case. And I was like, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. So we did have to put our foot down. A lot of times we didn't cover a movie. We didn't associate with the film if they were, you know, they had me to accusations. And it's fine. We might have lost some eyeballs over it, but I sleep better at night. Um, we're really happy that we're in a company that is 80% women. And in fact, a few girls have joined me from situations where they had a Me Too experience and they didn't want to work in that company anymore. And they said, we feel safer at Miss Malini, which is such a nice feeling. And I think we take it for granted because Never in a million years can I imagine our company would have, like I'm married to the CEO, you know, and my team is, I, they're my heart, they've been around for so long, and I can't imagine anyone treating a woman that way. But it happens so much, so it's very important to speak up. And I think the biggest problem that we all have, and even as women, when someone comes and says something happened to them, we have a tendency to say, is it though really true? Maybe she has some reason to say it. We have to stop doing that because the amount of courage it takes to come and say that something happened to me is way higher than anything that they will attain from doing that. So if she's, you know, like even with Vikas Bell, he kept saying, oh, she wants to be a director. That's why she said it. No woman is going to come and give such a graphic description of something that happened to her, especially in a country where she's going to be shamed more. And so it's really up to us, especially as women, not to doubt each other. You must give each other the benefit of the doubt in all such instances. And I really encourage people to do that. And also, I think as women, we must develop an understanding of how to protect the younger generation and fellow women because sometimes it's just a casual and attitude. And I think that that time where, you know, and our mothers did it, and I get it, like, you know, something happened, they'd say, don't create a scene, let it be you know, walk away. We have to change that. We have to teach our sons and our daughters not to be that way. And you know, actually, so I was interviewing Sonali Bendre and we did this series called Malini's Girl Tribe. And I wanted to talk to, about, talk to people about things that people are squeamish about, right? That we only, especially women, we feel a little awkward saying in front of people because it's so ingrained, right? Even to this day, if I drop a tampon on the floor, I'll be mortified if it rolls across the floor and I don't know why. And so I was talking to her about her son, and she was saying two things. She said, one, when she had her baby, she didn't feel that overwhelming mark up yar. And she was like, does that make me a bad mother? And then she said, I said, you know, everyone talks about you must raise your sons right. But at what age, how do you tell them to be better men? And she said, so my son is 10. And one day I accidentally said the F word in front of him. And he was like, mom, ha, you said the F word. And, but what does it mean? So she looked at her husband and they were like, is it too soon? But they're like, okay, now that it's come up, 
let's explain. So they explain that there's something called sex and men and women have it and it's a beautiful thing and that's how you were born. It's a sign of our love. But there's also something called rape, which is the worst violation anyone can have between two people. And such a great way of explaining this to your 10 year old. And I think it's really important that we do that. And I have a group also on Facebook called Positive Masculinity, where I feel it's important for us to have conversations with guys. Because two things happened. There was an actor who asked me, he's like, should I go through my phone? How do I know whether I've committed something that could be a me too? I'm like, one, if you're already worrying, you probably have. <laughs> two, think about, you know, people always say this about men and women, right? That, oh, how do I know? And I'm like, okay, how come when a guy gets hit on by a gay guy, he immediately knows when the line is being crossed? I'm like, apply that same filter, right? And two was the fact that I asked men, at what age or stage were you meant to feel that maybe your sister deserves less than you or you're more important? And they said two places. They said the dinner table and the playground. So at the dinner table, even us in our families have the tendency to serve the boy first, give him the extra paratha because he's a gro growing boy. And in the playground, the girl is supposed to sit carefully and not run around and not get dirty. And he's given a little more right of way. So even as parents, I think we have to be aware of at what age and stage we're sending those signals, where we're telling boys, don't cry. We're telling girls, you have to adjust. Um, and I know that we're setting them up in a world where they might have to learn to make certain compromises. But as a generation, if we make that shift, it'll make a big difference. Because I see this in Girl Tribe so much. So many women are suffering from mental and physical abuse from their in-laws or their husbands. And they're not independent, so they don't know what to do. And they're afraid to go back home. And I think it's important to create an atmosphere that you tell your daughters that it's OK. If, even if it's a love marriage and you made a mistake, you can come home. And I think that's something that we have to, you know, be able to tell the girls at least. Definitely. And I would just like to share that I have two young boys. And I think the first step to teaching them that is to respect yourself. So I have my boundaries. Like, they cannot talk to me in a certain way. If mom is sleeping, you can't just come and scream. Because they wouldn't do it around their dad. You cannot do it around me. Or if you didn't come to meet me, I also don't want to meet you. Like, I'm too busy as well. So certain small rules. But I think today my boys understand that mom's also got her, you as, know, yeah, As relevant, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So yeah, I think it's also up to the women to just start respecting themselves and saying, this is my boundary and you cannot do this, even if you are my child. So yeah, and I think they're scared of me now. So. <laughs> it's good, a little fear is always good. So um, let's just make it a little lighter now. And uh, Malani, what learning from all of this would you pass on to your younger self? I guess the one thing, and I even in my book, I wrote a chapter to my 18-year-old self. And the best... Um, advice I could give my younger self is that you are so rich in the currency of time. So don't worry so much about all the things that you're going to do, how you look, how much money you're going to make. And you know, by the way, it works out well, you marry a great guy, everything goes great. <laughs> but I think that the most important thing we have to tell ourselves at whatever stage you are, whether you're 20 or 50 or 80, you still have time on your side to f do all the things you want. You know, I, I always feel that we got life a bit wrong. We got so caught up in work and money and academics and impressing each other. We're only here for like 80 now, 100 years of our lives. Why are we here? You know, you're not going to take, they're always the cliche, you're not going to take anything with you that you came with, right? The greatest thing you'll ever learn, it's from Moulin Rouge, is how to love and be loved in return. Those are the things you're going to remember. You're not going to remember the days that you filled your bank account with a lot of money or you know you sat at a desk you're going to remember the days that you were the happiest or most heartbroken so feel all those emotions feel all those ups and downs and spend enough time as you can meeting people and having those experiences when i was five i told my mom when i grow up i want to meet everyone on the planet and she said good luck but i guess social media kind of lets you do that in a way to some extent but really make that effort to have a conversation with someone. And the best way to do that is instead of telling them about yourself, ask them something about them. Everybody has a story to tell. And everybody has, uh, you know, I don't know if you've read Brian Weiss's books. He has this amazing series. And there's another book called The Celestine Prophecy. And I'm sure some of you will follow along on this, is that the belief is that we are born again seven times so that we can go up and rise in levels 
in an alternate dimension. And it's much easier to do that in the human form because your karma is easier to improve. And you keep coming back in each li lifetime to learn a lesson that you have chosen for yourself. So very often when things are happening to me, I try to think about what is it that I've come back in this lifetime to learn? Is it patience? Is it self-constrained? What is it? Now, I'm a very jealous person, person and a very possessive person. So I'm convincing myself that I've come here to learn not to be so possessive and jealous and I'm <laughs> getting there. But whatever it is, you can choose for yourself what that lesson is. And it also says that, you know, so we're all separate souls, right? Even though you can't picture it and it's not, uh, you know, medically or scientifically proven, we know there's something more about us. And the belief is that we are actually one giant soul, or you can call God, all divided up into these little souls having this amazing experience of life. Which is why when you look into someone's eyes, you recognize yourself for a second. Because you're all part of this one larger being. And I genuinely believe that. So whenever you meet someone, just take a second to look them in the eye and see them. And they really are. That really is a window into the universe, into their soul. And that's going to be so much more satisfying. At the end of your time, you'll remember all those people that you really connected with. Lovely. Now I'm going to look deeply into your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and me in yours. <laughs> what is your one non-negotiable value? I guess, you know, the thing is values are a complicated thing. It's easy to say honesty or integrity and all those things. But I think I'll have to be honest and say maybe I wasn't always honest in my life. Maybe I wasn't, didn't have integrity in everything I did at the time. I might have done things that I'm not proud of today. I think the one thing that's non-negotiable for me is love. There has to be love. You know, you can make mistakes. You can screw up. You can hurt each other, but there should be some amount of genuine love. And if you don't have any love for me, then don't pretend to. You know, just be, I'm not saying honesty from the, the perspective of don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat. I'm saying be honest about what you want to give to me in our relationship. So before we enter into our rapid fire, I have one last question. This audience is a medley of professionals and homemakers and can you share like one unique strategy, an online marketing strategy or promotional strategy that worked well for you as a brand or maybe you implemented it to help another brand that we could utilize in our work? So you mean like a social media strategy or? Yeah. yeah. So a social media strategy, which I think is very simple, but people don't do enough of is remember that social media is a two way street. And the less you engage, the less engagement you'll get. We have a tendency to go put up a lot of content on our Instagram, our Facebook, and then we sit and we wait. And we wait, ki kuch nahi aya, nobody reply, nothing is happening, who's there? Because you're having a party for one and nobody is invited, right? Because you're not going to engage. It's that same thing. No, you don't go to somebody's birthday party, they're not going to come to yours, right? So you have to go and find like-minded content and people and engage with them. You know how good it feels when you get a comment or a like or a share. That's how other people feel too. So I spend a good three, four hours of my day going through other people's feeds, commenting, sharing, liking, engaging with people on similar topics. So my fashion team will go and you know, create conversations on fashion designers' pages or brands' pages, and that's how you start a conversation. Because again, the biggest advice I can give you is think about social media as a replica of the real world. And whenever you're about to do anything online, stop yourself and say, would I do this the same way in the real world? So when you're doing a marketing campaign online, think about, okay, if I was having a bake sale about some great cakes I'm making, what would I do? Would I just make a bunch of cakes and sit in my house and wait for someone to come buy them? Or would I do something else? What would I do? Would I take some and go over to a friend's house? Would I talk to people who are into baking and cooking and ask them for recipes and share mine. That's how people would get to know about me. So apply the human quotient to whatever you do. And then you'll do it best because you know yourself best. That's the advice my sister keeps telling me. You need to start following other people. <laughs> yeah, great. Now when it comes from you, I'm going to take this seriously. So we'll enter into a rapid fire, make this lighter. Okay. Um, if you got a last minute invite to a party which you couldn't refuse, what kind of dress would you go for? I'd wear a dress and sparkly sneakers. You can get away with murder and sparkly sneakers. Lovely. Quick fix makeup idea. Just liner, eyeliner. I never leave home without my kajal. I use it as liner. I use it liner on top and lip gloss. That's it. Favorite fashion designer? 
There's so many, but I really like uh, Gaurav Gupta because he just makes everyone look so silhouetted and he has these amazing, amazing structures and beautiful. And when it comes to Indian clothes, Anamika Khanna, I love her thing. Oh, I love Anamika. Um, favorite spot for retail therapy? I guess online. <laughs> I spend a lot of time scrolling and adding things to cart, which I don't usually buy. But I really like Label Life. I don't know if you've uh, shopped there. They have some really nice stuff. Yeah. Um, your poison? Vodka Red Bull, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Girlfriend or boyfriend? Both. I have, well, I have a husband and many 4 a.m. girlfriends, but I keep joking with my best friend. I'm like, I wish I could have married you and been best friends with my husband. Things would be amazing. Oh, they would be relaxing. <laughs> Who's your 3 a.m. bestie? Parul, she's my best friend. She is also Mumbai Mummy on Instagram and she has four children and I don't know how she does it. <laughs> your favorite comfort food? I really like uh, dal chawal or butter chicken. Dal chawal or? Butter chicken. Oh. Uh, what's on your bucket list for this year? Well, I have to finish my book and I'm really freaking out because I've written like the title and five topics, but I have to finish that. That's on my bucket list. I'm really hoping to make Girl Tribe a much bigger endeavor and launch five cities of doing the cons the, the Brave, which is a big event. Um, and I really, I want to be able to, at the end of this year, say that, turn around and say we made some kind of positive impact and move the needle on the internet. I really want to see if we can add some sort of helpful legislation that if women are being trolled or sexually abused online, that we can actually do something about it legally. So I've been trying to speak to Milindera, who's a you know, member of parliament, and uh, figure out what is the, apparently there is um, legal uh, standing already. You can go to a police station and report it, but I don't know how effective that is or how comfortable that is, so we're gonna try to explore that and try to find a simpler, more convenient way to actually report these things. And I think if it could just be online, if we could just yeah, submit online. that form, Absolutely. it would be. You know, a lot of women feel the fear of getting out, yeah. Uh, if you were an animal, which animal would you be? I think I would be a baby tiger, like a tiger cub. Like, it never grow up. <laughs> um, what's your reaction to unwanted attention? It depends what kind of unwanted. I guess if it's creepy messages, I get really uncomfortable. And then like, even if we go out to, like, at, to a bar or something and people are being creepy, I'm one of those people who stand in the middle and be like, what's your problem? So <laughs> I'm not very uh, subtle about it. So you're a tomboy? I guess so. I'm a mix. I mean, I like to wear sneakers, but I like to dress up. So I'm like a princess tomboy. Wow. Uh, if a movie was made on you, which actress should play your part? Oh my God, I mean, I guess everyone I would love to be like a Deepika or Alia, but I guess it has to be whoever would want to do it and whoever best fits the role. What drives you? FOMO, the fear of missing out. <laughs> and that's all my questions. I'm already in love with you because you share Thank your you. birthday with my husband. Oh wow, <laughs> must be a great guy. He is, he is. And so are you. It was fantastic to be in this conversation Thank you, with you're you. an amazing uh, host. I really enjoyed speaking to you. Thank you.